Hey, welcome to this week's show, uh, the Cam and Otis Show, in case you missed the four other times I said it in the uh, introduction. Yes, this is the Cam and Otis Show. Uh, episode number five zero. That would be 50 for those of you who are counting. Uh, yeah, that's uh, hard to believe. Uh, and it's funny, though, because when you do a weekly show, 50 is like, 50 is a lot. But when you do a weekly show, it's like, but it's not a year yet, because 52 would be a year. Damn Romans. That's true. Damn Romans screwed us all up with that. Why couldn't, why couldn't we have metric times and metric dates? Think about how simple life would be. Be very le- a lot less math. We just took a zero off, you know. If, you know, if- I I'd love to agree with the statement, but I'm going back to all my astronomy of where those numbers come from, and there's a whole lot of science that went into it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Science. Yeah. Overrated. I'm telling you, <laughs> just do what you think's right. You know, I, I might I might start a metric autonomous zone here in Monument. I'm gonna put up a fence. Everybody, everybody will have to change their watch to decimal places. <laughs> I think that's a great hey, idea. Uh, yeah, well, you know, why not? I mean, I, I know where I can get some concrete barriers, spray paint, you know, hang some signs up. I you know, it's probably... one of those things. Everyone, everyone agrees with you on the metric stuff, but who's going to pay for all the speed limit signs? Yeah, I know. Uh, there you go, Mr. Economist. Oh, yeah. Hey, it's easier, to put a, it's easier to put a chapter in the books that teaches you to multiply things times 2.2 and then you're set. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Uh, all right. What the hell were we, we were going to talk about? Uh, uh, problems. We don't get to do that very often. The little tangents to start off, the little how you doing stuff. We, with guests, you don't really get to do that as much. We just jump right into things. Yeah. Well, cause you know, we kind of respect their time too. And, uh, uh, and, and then, you know, quite frankly, most of them are sitting there going, okay, what's going to happen now? Uh, and then if you and I go off into the tangent, they're just kind of sitting there going, depending on the guest. I mean, we've had a few that would dive right in with us, of course. But uh, I would say, for the most part, they would sit there and go, well, this is a good use of my time. Thanks for inviting me in, fellas. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> so flexibility, right? Oh yeah. But yeah, we can get right started. Uh, talk about how to analyze and solve some problems, do some problem solving, our favorite stuff. That's right. That's right. Uh, don't bring me problems, bring me solutions there, mister. Mm-hmm. Always said that guys would come into my office when I was in the army and this is happening. This is happening. Eh, I don't know. And I get out of here, come back when you got some ideas on how to fix it. I mean, mm-hmm. don't waste my time just telling me something's broke. Give me the phone number to the water heater repairman. You know, it's, it's not, you know, I, I just, some people, and, and that's just the way they're brought up. You know, mm-hmm. as we've talked about a bunch of times, uh, I don't fault people, just got to retrain them, right? They got to, they got to learn that you identify a problem. I mean, people are really, really good at pointing out faults. Mm-hmm. It's really easy to point out faults and tell you that's broke, that's that's messed up. I mean, I've done it. Somebody hands me a document to review and edit, and I read through it, and I go, oh, yeah, that, no, that doesn't make sense, that doesn't make sense. It's kind of hard to come up with how to rewrite, <laughs> you know, a sentence that doesn't make sense, and also depends on who and what I'm doing it for. But, uh, yeah, uh, but problem solving. So coming back to so how do you solve it when you see that problem and identify it how do you come up with a solution you know well as i was preparing for the episode i thought this is something as i was kind of going through my what i would say i got what two two years now real life i could say problem solving and you compare it to all your books on problem solving you take your management classes and all this different stuff and it's really funny one of the things i was thinking about it goes back to you know scientific method type stuff that you learn in high school and everything of First step is identify the problem. Mm -hmm. You never spend any time talking about identifying the problem though. That's like the assumed variable when you're starting something. Because when you're taking a test in school, they have a problem for you and they put it right in your face. And then you can go on and you can analyze and you can solve the problem from there. And you can practice everything else. But as far as actually identifying the problem, I think that's something that is a really, uh, you know, call it like a muscle. That's a muscle that doesn't get worked out very much. And I think that's part of the problem when you talk about folks that 
are just able to identify or point out problems. And that's all they're doing is pointing out problems is when you have that kind of mindset, I don't think you're really pointing out the not right problems necessarily. You're not getting into depth enough with the situation or with what's going on to identify a problem properly so that you can really move forward, analyze it and find solutions for it. All right. First off, do we have a problem ticker? Problem uh, ticker. No, we should have though. We'll put we that we'll, because, we'll edit because that you've already said it 15 times. Uh, but yeah, hey, it's I, I tell you, that's all right. I, I tell you what, uh, what it goes back to is, is, is how, how you're educated. You're educated. Here's a problem and then solve this problem, right? As opposed to define the problem in the, in the larger sense. And when you, you know, when you step out now that you've, you know, got a couple of years under your belt in the business world, you, know, you start to see that, okay, that's a problem, but how do I define it? Because defining the problem, like you said, is, is step one. And, uh, you know, in some of the, and I can't remember where it was that I, I was working or, or what education system I might've been in, but the big thing, it may have been project management, but the big thing was uh, identifying the problem statement and creating a problem statement. And that, that is really the ideal thing that you have to do is what's the problem statement, you know, because you can contain it. Now, when you can contain a problem, define it, then you can solve it. When you just say, oh, that's all fucked up. Well, you can't solve, that's all fucked up. You have to solve the problem but in order to solve it you have to define it and that's that's the hard part uh one of the hardest parts i think and even in all the years of uh doing what i've done and, and going into what we'll we'll talk about in the problem solving methodology i'm going to talk about uh the hardest part is what's that problem statement you know define it and, and be clear about it as opposed to just saying it's broke. You know, it's, it, it goes back to here. Here's a, here's another analogy in the business world. When you're selling a product, what you're really selling is a solution to your client. Mm -hmm. What is the client buying? They're buying a transformation. Uh, one of my friends, uh, Steve, Steve was talking about this the other day. You know, when I sell somebody a drill, because they need a hole in the wall to hang a picture. Am I selling them a drill? Am I selling them a hole? Or am I selling them the opportunity to display beautiful art? Mm. So you think about it that way. And that's, and that's the same analogy that you have to use in order to solve a problem. You have to get it into that, that clarity of definition. And I think that goes into uh, another one of my big pieces when I was going through my notes is what's your desired outcome? You know, what is the end goal of what you're working on? Because you can identify a problem, but that might, that might not be what's actually affecting your end goal. It could be something completely different. You know, well, we're sending out gift boxes for Verbi. We got, a, we got a company that's not working very well with us. Is the problem, what is our end goal in this situation? End goal is sending out those gift boxes, getting them to our customers, having the customers being happy. Now, what is the limiting factor inside of that, that we don't have a certain piece of that gift box that's not to us yet. That is identified as what the limiting factor is. And then it's, okay, what is the problem that's causing that limiting factor to be the issue? You know, is it the fact that these people aren't communicating well? Is it the fact that we forgot to pay them? You know, what, what, what is the actual problem that's causing this issue that is limiting your potential outcome? I think that's where you have to get to get to that mindset because when you don't think about the, the desired outcome, you wind up losing yourself into the nitty gritty of what's going on rather than looking at the big picture of what you actually want to get out of something. Yeah, uh, you're right. The outcome. I mean, so if you're driving down the highway and your car breaks down, is the outcome that you want the brakes fixed or, you know, you need your car towed or, or is the outcome is that you were trying to get to work? Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, that's, that's really it. And then once you understand the outcome, then you can come back to, okay, what was the problem? And that's a great analogy too, is what's, you know, Hey, truck don't run no more. So how do I fix it? Right. I got to figure out what the problem is with the truck, you know, start to eliminate things and define it down because I can't just, I mean, you could, 
wouldn't be a real wise idea to just start replacing parts. You know, okay, buy new wheels. Let's we'll see if that fixes it. Nope, that didn't fix it. <laughs> let's fix, you know, let's put a new hood on it. Nope, that didn't fix it. So that's a really good analogy because what happens when your vehicle breaks down, you, know, you either roll it in your own garage and tinker with it and fix it, or you take it to a mechanic and what do they do? They drill they down and they define it into this part, this, this valve, the PCV valve is not opening and closing properly. So the airflow into your carburetor is messed up. And that's why your vehicle is missing and stalling out while you try to accelerate on the highway. Oh, so let me fix that. Five, let me replace that $5 part. Right. And I think, I, I, you know, I, I love this analogy, if we can stick on that for a second, because as you're talking about, you know, which variables are critical, I think that's a big thing to look at when you're doing problem solving and taking the car example. Hey, guess what? My truck's AC don't work. It hasn't worked for a while and that sucks, but I drive with the windows down because that is a non-critical failure as far as I'm concerned with the truck. What we used to always say with uh, the old car, the Maxima, right? Runs good, stops good, turns good. That's all really matters, right? <laughs> Everything else, those are your critical variables right there. Everything else is kind of just nice stuff that you want to have. You know, Maxine had those nice power seat belts. Those always worked. That wasn't the problem. But the problem would be when the alternator went out or when the transmission started messing up on us. That was the critical failures that were going to cause, that were going to be identified as our problems and cause you to not get your desired outcome out of the situation. Yeah. yeah well, let's, let's, uh, Let's jump into a little bit of the, the technique I want to talk about. And uh, it's, it's the military, part of the military decision-making process, and we call it the mission analysis. So you'll hear uh, those of you in the Army and the Marine Corps have heard MDMP all, you know, your entire career. I don't care whether you... They've also heard it for 50 episodes now. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's true. That's true, too. Uh, but MDMP, you know, military decision-making process. Uh, but first part of that is mission analysis. So what happens, it's, it's not, you're not, well, you really are. So what is a mission that the higher headquarters gives the company, battalion, platoon, squad, whatever, they give them a mission. And that mission is the problem. And now they've got to understand the problem. They've got to analyze the problem in order to create a solution. Mm -hmm. And that's what mission analysis is. And it works the same in any other situation, whether, whether, you know, you're, you need, you got too many tools in your garage. You know, one of my favorite analogies when I'm teaching this to in a seminar is, Hey, I got my garage is overcrowded. I don't have room to park my new truck in because I have so many tools. How do I fix that? And then we start to analyze, well, what is the problem? The problem is the problem. Too many tools is the problem. Space is the problem a new truck, you know, all these sort of things, you start to analyze that. And the first thing you do is you have to understand what's the critical piece, like you were just talking about. What are those things, we call them mission essential tasks mm -hmm. that you dive into and understand. Meaning these are the tasks that are defined and then you take them one more step and I'm gonna come back to it and just say, so these are the tasks that are defined in your mission, in your orders in your view of what's next okay to stay in the, the more conceptual thing so it applies better mission essential is that that thing and then we take those mission essentials and we find out which ones are the mission criticals so if i don't do if i have 10 mission essential tasks but there's two that if i don't do those two it's like there's no way it can be successful all right, so uh, you know if to stay in the tool shed mind, you know example, if if I am unable to park my truck in the garage or in a shelter, shelter my truck from the weather, then that's mission failure. So that's a mission critical task is getting shelter for the truck, mm -hmm. and we see how we start to understand that. The other piece of that is well. What else, what are some other factors? Well, your mom, Miss Suzanne says, you got way too many tools. Why don't we, why don't you filter out some of those tools? You know, you got, you got five shovels. Do you really need five shovels? Well, of course I do. If I have, 
you know, rugby team come over and dig holes for me. Uh, yeah, I need five shells, but you know, mm -hmm. okay, do I really? So I start to, there's another thing. So maybe, maybe that's another critical task that I need to do in order to accomplish that. So that's, that's step one is you analyze for those mission essential tasks uh, and then the mission critical task out of that. Mm -hmm. And then what I would add on to that is as you're looking at things, trying to analyze the problem, understanding, really getting into the nitty gritty of the problem, understanding what's going on there, why things are critical, which is also an important aspect to think about when you're going through this process and you're looking at things is never, never stop asking why, you know, why do I need five shovels? Yes, you need five shovels because you're going to have rugby boys over on Saturday to come dig holes for you you know, fill them back in once they're done. But I mean, doesn't everybody do that? I mean, that's <laughs> standard weekend activity. Oh yeah. That's I mean, well, hell, I guess I grew up with it. <laughs> but <laughs> if you, you got to understand why these things are critical because then you know whether or not they're actually critical. You know, you can know whether or not they really feed into that greater outcome that you're talking about, or if they're just not a big piece of it. And then a big aspect of that, as you're looking through it is, what is critical, not just to me, what is critical to the mission, like you're talking about, then also what is critical to the other members of the team or the other members of the environment. So when you use mom in that example, is it critical for you that you get rid of those tools? Well, not necessarily because you like all your tools, you spent money on them, you might need them at some point, right? But if she needs a space in the garage to park her car instead of just putting your truck inside or whatever other outcome that she's looking for that is her desired outcome you're going to have to work with that because she's a part of your team and i think that's an important piece of understanding is kind of that that uh flip perspective go to a different role it's not you're not always you can't always wear your ceo hat that's not going to get you very far because you're not going to understand the problems necessarily whereas if you start thinking about things from you know your lower people down in your team or think about them uh from the perspective of the client Think about them from the perspective of competition. Think about it from all these different perspectives and you can really start to understand the problem and you'll probably find a lot better solutions when you think about things that way. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and you know, that's that whole team thing and getting the understanding because as you were saying that, what I was thinking about the other piece of that is, so what if I'm not an expert in building a tool shed or, or, or whatever? I need to bring in experts. Right. Uh, I need to expand, you know, add a bathroom to my house. I can kind of come up with some ideas, but I better find an expert that can come up and help me solve that to get to the solution set, the outcome that I want. It's not just I need a new bathroom. You know, it's these other things that right. I need and even to if, have happen. And even if you can do part of it, you know, you build an out a room or something. You could probably build out a room, but I know you're probably going to call an electrician and a plumber because that's the higher skill stuff there that's going to be more critical to the failure of the room. You know, you're pretty confident you can put some two by fours together and frame up a building, but that's a little different than getting the plumbing and the electricity working right. And it's about oh, yeah. understanding that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, it's who, can, who can perform those tasks for you. So you do your mission essential tasks. You identify, you know, the, those those critical tasks that you have to do. And then the next thing you got to do is I, I call it uh, the white space, identifying the white space, right? It, it is, it is what, what are the, what's those things in between that, Oh, by the way, I got to go to home Depot and, and, you know, buy a box of screws and, and uh, you know, nails and, lumber and oh yeah hey the saw set set up i have isn't going to work so i need to get a new saw those are implied tasks that you have to start putting together in order to accomplish those critical tasks so that that's that's the next thing that you got to do in this problem solving piece that yeah makes you got to make sure you got to make sure that you're understanding the entire formula what you're working with because otherwise yeah. you start solving a problem and you realize you don't have a saw to cut the wood or whatever it's going to be because then, and then, Hey, you're creating new problems for yourself that weren't going to be these big critical problems because you failed to assess the situation properly. You missed out on that. And I think, mm -hmm. I think a big piece of that, and it's just, I think really, I guess it's just another way of phrasing it is looking at it as why is this happening? Not what is the problem, but why is this happening? 
And I, you know me, I'm all about the, the framing stuff and flipping your perspectives on things. And to me, it's when you think about it from why is this happening, you start really trying to understand what the problem is and why, how it got to there. You're seeing the cause and effect relationships. You're not just seeing the problem. And when you see the cause and effect relationships, you can start getting to actual solutions. You know, you, that's how you step away from what is the problem, being the person who can point out every problem with what's going on and becoming the person who says, well, this ca A caused B and therefore we're not going to be able to get C or whatever type of situation you're in because you're seeing the cause and effect relationship, which is how you're going to be able to understand the problem and then put in a proper solution. Right, right. I mean, that that is... But that is part of understanding those those tasks. You know, what's the what's the most important thing down to the the auxiliary task or the you know the the, the white space tasks that come to be. You know, because even if you think about it, if I gotta go to Home Depot, what's another implied task I gotta go to Home Depot? Well, do I have fuel in my truck? Oh, and in order to start my truck, I need to get my keys. I got to get my keys and I got to put my keys so you can, you can get into a ridiculous amount of detail and in implied tasks and get overwhelmed by it. Uh, but the important thing is to think about those, those little white space areas and realize that here's, you know, in my material list of things to build a tool shed, these are the things I have to do to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. And I think a big piece of that, you know, when you make the, the truck, does the truck have gas example is I think that's a perfect example of the implied task because it's something that depending on the situation may or may not be critical. You know, I go into physical therapy yesterday and I got in the truck and went, Ooh, I'm a little low and started doing the math of, okay, it's about 3.2 miles away. I've got half a gallon of gas in this truck that should get me about five, maybe six miles. Okay. I can get there, fill up on my way home, you know, and I'm no longer going to be late to something because I didn't think about that. But if you're going to a doctor's appointment or you're going to an appointment, you're going to a meeting, something that you can't be late to and you get in and you haven't filled up your truck. Ooh, that's darn close to critical failure right there. Cause you got to stop for five minutes and fill up your truck. So as much as you can't get lost in the weeds on these implied tasks, it's also important to make sure you're keeping them in the back of your mind because Hey, same type of thing. Where are the keys? I've lost my keys before. I've been 15 minutes late to stuff because I can't find my freaking keys because they're in my shorts from last night or whatever. But you have to be able to think about all of those things and build it into your time, you know, because those examples right there takes five minutes to find your keys, 10 minutes maybe if you really lose them, five minutes to fill up the truck. It's nothing crazy to plan around when you're talking about like contingency planning or anything. But also, you know, I guess I was raised by someone who gets 15 minutes early everywhere. So I built in that buffer most of the time when I'm doing things. But when you build in that buffer, that's you just contingency planning for all of these little things that could possibly go wrong inside the big picture to solve that problem. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I need to jump back to something that I just, you know, I went right into the task. Uh, but something that's much more, just as important, actually, all these are, are of the same level of importance and understanding, but it's facts. So what are the facts, the true things that you know that you have to, that, that exist, that are true, you know, that, that are, uh, you know, the sun will come up tomorrow. Okay. That's a fact. The, uh, uh, the, the tools are in the garage currently and the truck is in the driveway currently. Those are facts. Uh, you know, the truck is this size. I have this much volume of tools. Those are facts that you have that apply towards those solutions that you're going to create after you analyze and dive in the problem. So facts are, are just, just as critical because that's, that's the things you know for a fact. That's why we call them facts because they're, that's the way it exists. There, there's no debate about it. The truck is this size. You know, it's 18 feet long, whatever it is. Those sort of things exist and you know that. Uh, as, and that comes into play when you start to develop your solutions. 
you know, as, as I'm thinking about it, I've kind of got it into three categories when you're looking at things on that. And I'm sure you've got an official army list that has four or five categories to make me look bad, but I'm going to go ahead anyway. Of you're going to have your facts. Those are the things that you're 100% sure on. This is what's happening. This is what's going on there. These are facts. Then after that, you're going to have your kind of assumed variables where things that you're not 100% on, you're not sure about, but it's something that you're not going to factor into your casual decision making. You know, it's raining in Tucson right now. Am I factoring in rain in the desert into my plan? No, I'm not because it's not going to rain most likely. And it's not raining very hard, even if it does come down, right? You're now, close. monsoon season, that's a whole nother game. But you have, to, you have to have these things in the back of your mind, but you're not letting the variability inside of it stress you out and distract you from the actual problem solving. But, but you're close. So on, on those... It's an, we refer to it as assumptions, and these are assumptions that you create. So your assumption may be that, hey, it's going to be sunny this weekend for the 4th of July barbecue picnic. So I'm not going to sit, I don't need to go rent canopies or anything like that. We're just going to enjoy the sunshine. That's an assumption. And it's an assumption that has to be become true in order for my course of action that I select, my plan that I select to be executed as planned. That makes sense? So Definitely. assumptions become facts. And when we're planning, we make an assumption because there are a lot of times there's, you know, you, you kind of like the implied test. You know, you can, you can get carried away with it. Well, I assume that Home Depot is going to have the size uh, screws that I need and and uh, I assume that the road's going to be, yeah, come on now. It is the, the things that need to become true, need to become facts in order for your plan to act or your plan to be able to be executed. Yeah, I, th I think that defines it really well. Uh, and then I was going to get into the third category when you're looking at things is what I'm going to chalk up to one of our favorite words over the last month or favorite two words over the last month, which is imagined malice. <laughs> what is really causing this problem? Is there a fact causing this problem? Or is it the, you know, is it somebody went out and put a nail in your tire and gave you a flat? Or did you drive over a nail on your way home yesterday and you just didn't notice? And when you're in that stressed problem solving environment, you tend to look for things that are big and evil and they're attacking you. Because like we've talked about before, it's so easy to see the world as good and evil. It's so easy. Everything out there, everything that's going against you is evil. Everything that's going for you is good. And the world makes sense when it's like that. It's nice and easy for us. But the idea that there's just random chance happening all the time, there's all this different stuff that could screw up everything you're doing. That's what, that's what we're actually living in. And when, when you think about things in terms of the, that malice, you're imagining that malice and everything that's going on, you're not going to wind up solving the problem accurately because you're going to be lashing out at, at this imagined figure. You know, I got, a, I got a flat tire a couple of years ago and I remember thinking, looking at it and it was one of those, I, I analyzed it a little bit, but it was a big old bolt in my tire. And I just thought, how the hell? did that get in there? Like, I was like, somebody had to have come up and done that. There's no freaking way a bolt this long would manage to just perfectly go up my tire like that. Well, you know, if there's any physicists listening to the show, I would love to see the diagram of how it happened, but I came to accept it because frankly, why the hell would someone do that to me? <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't make sense that way. But when you have that imagined malice, I wasn't even thinking about solving the problem. I was too busy thinking about what kind of jerk would come in and put a bolt in my tire. And you're, you're just not even thinking about solving the problem. It completely distracts you from what's actually going on. So I think that's the third big factor when you're looking at these things. I'm not sure if you have anything to add to that list. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't fit into the mission analysis. So, because that's, that's over here, that's an influential piece in your mindset. You know, it goes back to something that I talked about the other day, uh, I think in one of my, my uh, newsletters or something, but if you're frustrated, pissed off about, you know, a flat tire on your truck and the fact that you believe, you know, you have this perception in your mind that somebody might've done it with intention, creating that imagined malice, then your, your ability to solve the problem is, is, uh, is tainted, mm -hmm. for lack of a better way of putting it. It's your perception is, is, is focused on that as opposed to a solution. Your perception is, well, your problem solving becomes, 
all right, well, who's that son of a bitch who did that? And I want to go find out why he did it and, and, and get back at him mm -hmm. as opposed to that, that becomes your problem. A hundred percent. Yeah. As opposed to the real problem, which is, Oh, I got a flat tire, which means I can't get to that meeting because now I got a flat tire in my truck and then I got to do all these other things to fix that. So I'm not worried about that problem. I'm worried about some imaginary person thing out there that is out to get me. Mm -hmm. And it's a complete distraction from your ability to solve the problem. And even, you know, I'd kind of throw this together with something. And when you talk about understanding what's inside your control and what's outside your control, you have to, you have to keep that in mind when you're looking at these problems as well, because there, maybe it's an assumption, maybe it's a fact, maybe it's imagined malice, it doesn't matter. If it's something that you can't help, you can, you can still factor it into the equation when you're looking at things, but that shouldn't be something that you're losing sleep over or stressing out about, because since you can't actually do anything about it, it's just a part of the world you're living in. It's just an assumed variable as you're moving through things. You need to focus on how you can solve this problem, not what they can do to help you or whatever. You know, I'll go back to my example of Verbi with the gift boxes and stuff. The, for us, it, now, could I go down there and probably yell at them? Eh, they probably won't let me in because they're private business and, you know, masks and all that kind of stuff. But the, could I swing by there and knock on the door and, you know, hold up a sign and say, hey, you know, give me my damn glasses. You guys have been screwing around with this for way too long. Yeah, would that help? Maybe a little bit. But in the bigger picture, it's look, this is something that's outside my control. They're, they're being crappy with business, quite frankly. Uh, I that's not something that I can help. I can't help them pull their head out. I, I can't help. I can't help them fix their business model to where this isn't a problem that they're going to have. You know, if they ask me to, maybe I could help a little bit, but that's completely outside of my control. What I, what do you have to switch your focus on then is okay. Well, what's my desired outcome going back to it? Happy customer. Right? Mm -hmm. So then it's not just how do I get these whiskey glasses out to my customer? It's how do I keep my customer happy inside this uh inside the situation that's already existing i'm not losing the sleep over the fact that these people are being bad at their business i'm not losing sleep over that i'm too busy thinking about the next phase of it which is how am i going to keep my customers happy keep those raving fans coming back for more verbi events and all this kind of stuff because that's what really matters in the big picture yeah yeah i mean it, it, it's a distraction right it's not really solving the problem that when you get pissed off like that. Uh, one more category, and it's a, it's a subsetted category that we got to talk about too. Yeah, I know. So we've got all this. You got to have two subsets here. for it to work, right? Yeah, that's right. That's why it's a subsetted category because there's two things underneath. There you go. But, but you see, you have all this information and you're defining your problem and you're analyzing your problem. And you're putting all this information into these categories to help you analyze the problem so that you can create a plan to create the solution to solve the problem, right? So the other one is constraints. In constraints, your subsets under constraints are must do's and can't do's. That thing I have to do, well, you know, I, 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 have, to, I have to eat lunch at 12 o'clock every day because, you know, from 12 to one in my contract, it says that's my, that's my time. I must do that. Or uh, another example, go to my tool shed. I have to get approval from the homeowners association before I can build my tool shed. So that is a must do. It can also be an implied task, you know, and that one a little bit of the fuzzy area. And, you know, if you're, if you're at the scholar level, you can debate about which, which column that your information goes to. And I've seen it. I've been, I, I've, I've witnessed it and had to like, all right, got it. Yes. You think it's a constraint and you think it's a implied task. Does it really matter as long as we capture that information? Mm -hmm. That's the critical piece. As long as you have that information captured in your analysis so that you take it into, a, into account when you start to develop your plan. So now that I know I must get approval from the homeowners association in order to build a shed, right? That, that is a must do. Now, uh, I can't do. Miss Suzanne says, well, you can't put it here. It's got to go over there. That's a can't do, right? Uh, you know, the, and just what else? I mean, there, there's any number of things that are 
in that can't do. I might say, can't get rid of any more tools. I need to have, can't go lower than three shovels in my, in my pile of tools. So that's a can't do, can't go below three shovels. Must maintain three shovels. There's my can't do. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, so there's this, but really in the end, with all these things, the, the facts, assumptions, mission essential, the, the mission, um, uh, mission essential tasks, the, the critical tasks, the uh, implied task, and the constraints, the whole idea of that is not that you get everything precisely in the right columns, is that you have the mind to visualize things and capture things in those ways so that you can understand them when you create the solution to take care of them and make sure that you, you know, do the things you have to do. All right. right. You know, must go through TSA security checkpoint before I get on an airplane. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's part of my plan. And I think, I think to your point, as you kind of make the, the scholar joke on that one of if you're looking at things and you're worrying about where they're going into different categories, you're kind of missing the point because each of these categories plays in to our big algorithm as far as analyzing the problem and solving the problem. You don't forget about different things just because you put in a different category. It just gets treated slightly different, but you're still, it's still a factor, you know, whether it's an implied implied task or a critical task it doesn't really matter that much to you because you're the, what matters is that you're identifying the task in the first place. And then mm -hmm. if you identify the task and you ask why I have to do this task, then you have a better understanding of it. It doesn't matter what category you put it into. You understand what's going on with that task. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's all the background. It's, it's capturing all the background of that information. You know, the whys may be, it may be constraints that might be part of the whys, right? Uh, but understanding the, the full scope and the effects of the piece, parts and pieces of the problem as you define it out, so that you have a better solution set, a better plan to reach that solution is the reason you go through these steps. Now, you can do it formally, you know, in a big planning room with boards and diving in and everything like that, or you can uh, just do it in your head and you go through these steps and, and the more you practice it, the more subconsciously you start to do it and everything from, hey, where do you want to go to dinner tonight? Oh, okay. Well, what are my what are my constraints? Well, I don't want to spend more than than forty bucks for the two of us to go out to dinner. I don't want to I don't want to drive more than thirty minutes. You know, there, there there's a couple of constraints right there. But what is my what is my outcome? An enjoyable time. Mm. That's my outcome. That's what I want. That's my solution. Is how do I get to an enjoyable time? That's the that that's it. So my problem becomes. I start to analyze the facts. Well, we're going to get hungry. That's a fact. You can, or some people might say it's an assumption, you know, again, you know, I guess it really, in, in truth, it really, I would go is assumption assumption. On that. it really is an assumption because you're assuming that, you know, come later in the day, this is always so funny when you talk so many arbitrary things like this, but later in the day, I'm going to assume I'm going to be hungry. Mm-hmm. So, because otherwise, if I'm not hungry, then I ain't going to dinner. Right. Right. But I may still want to go and have a good time. Mm -hmm. So there's your counter to that also. See how life, life's not black and white. There's no, there's no clear cut solutions to any of these things. Even something simple as just going to dinner. Oh yeah. Well, I was going to say, you know, as you're talking through this, one of the, this is where I put on my behavioral economics hat is what you're really trying to do in that situation is maximize your utility, right? You're trying to get the most enjoyment out of it possible inside of your given constraints. And, mm -hmm. you know, whether that's going to a steakhouse and you get a steak, but you don't get mashed potatoes because the steakhouse is pricey or, Hey, you go to McDonald's and get yourself 20 hot and spicies, whatever, whatever gives you that utility is going to be what gets the outcome that you actually want. That's how you go through your decision-making process. Uh, you're thinking about all of these different things and how much good you're going to get out of it. Your, let's say your assumption that you're hungry is wrong. Well, you don't want to go to McDonald's because you know, you're just going to be drinking Sprite. Maybe you want to go to the pub instead because then you can get a beer and you can still get some of that utility that you were looking for on your night out. 
Yeah, exactly. So it, it, you know, what are those, what are those factors that apply? And as you, as you dive into, you know, these, these columns, if you will, that, that I talked about, uh, you know, facts, assumptions, constraints, uh, essential tasks, and uh, specified tasks. There's the word I was looking for. Holy crap, specified tasks. Finally came into me. I don't know why. Specified tasks become essential tasks, right? Uh, but specified tasks and, and implied tasks, you start to dive into that. You start to understand the problem a lot better. And that's, that's the other part of this exercise is you gain a better understanding of the problem so that you can create a more viable solution to the problem. Exactly. And I think that's really all, all, you know, the all encompassing to bring it back around is that you're just making sure that you truly understand what's going on. You've asked why enough times that you can piece together what's going on. And then you can have a real solution into these things instead of like we talked about before, instead of putting a band aid on it or, Hey, and here's, here's one of those inside the constraints. Maybe you need a band aid. Maybe that's all you need because you just need to get down the road a little bit, you know, is a spare tire a solution. And it gets you home, doesn't it? Gets you to the mechanic, gets you to discount tires. You can go get more, <laughs> get a new set of tires. But yeah. it isn't a long-term solution. It's just a band-aid that can move you forward towards your end goal and get you to that desired outcome. Right, right. In the bigger picture, because you know the constraint is I only have so much money, or I only have so much time. So that can, that's always a constraint, and in factors into your solution set as you build it. But the point is that. You take, you take these categories and you capture all that information because now when you have that information and you continue to add to it and understand the problem better, you get a better analysis of it and it goes back to your solution is a much more powerful, much more accurate solution to get to that outcome, that end state that you're looking to achieve the result that you want to get. Yeah, great. Well, there's one question before we start wrapping up here in a second. And I, we're not going to be able to go all the way through this tangent because it's a whole other damn episode. Because what, we did the first half of it, right? We covered the identify analysis. Now it's what do we do from there? And so one mm -hmm. thing I wanted to ask you, I thought it'd be an interesting one because I'm pretty sure you do both. I do both when I'm problem solving. If you had to pick between a more effective uh, mechanism for solving your problems, would you pick between brainstorming or meditating? As in sitting down, like I have to come up with 50 ideas versus sitting down and just thinking about it to put it, you know, because really what are you doing? You're meditating. You're just focusing on a problem in a very in-depth way and trying to find those solutions. Well, when you create solutions, you have to brainstorm. Mm -hmm. So whether if, if you look at meditating on a problem, you know, stop, take your time and focus on the problem you're doing what we just talked about. You're doing that mission analysis and you're, you're analyzing the problem set and not really creating a solution if you're focused on the problem. Mm -hmm. So now you've broken it all out and defined it. How do you come up with a solution? You got to brainstorm, whether, whether it's an official brainstorming session, you know, where you, people are just, you, you got a group of people together and you're throwing out ideas and you're using post-it notes and, doing a little design thinking action in there too and categorizing and things like that. Yeah. Uh, you have to brainstorm in order to create solutions. And that's actually the next step. You know, after you've done the mission analysis, you, you created all this, you've captured all this information and then you, the next step, first step is, okay, so now I've defined the problem. What's my, Restated mission is what we used to call it or restated problem. What's my problem definition? Mm -hmm. And then all these other pieces are the supporting information for that problem definition. And that problem definition is the, that's what I need to solve. That's, that's where it comes down to. Here's my problem definition. My solution solves that problem. Okay. Well, I was going to disagree a little bit on the meditation side of that. Because to me, I found the, the forced brainstorming. Because that's when I, when I think of brainstorming, I think of the like, okay, we're not leaving this room until we have 50 ideas type thing. <laughs> that kind of stuff where it's really just how many different things can you come up with and then seeing which one of those fit. When I'm normally going through it, I like to do the forced brainstorm followed by meditating on things. But also what I really wanted to disagree on was 
to me, and I think this is just goes into what we've been talking about this whole time about how, when you analyze a problem, you find the solutions more easily is when I stop and I meditate on something that's, you know, when it's a big enough problem that I need to stop and I say, okay, I need 20 minutes to just stop and think about this. Usually I come out of that with one really, really good solution that I have to go run with and make sure it actually works. But as I go through that analysis and I stop and really think about all the different details to it, there's usually one thing that actually comes to mind as far as something that can really affect change inside the equation and get you that desired outcome. And how'd you come up with that? By analyzing. Brainstorming in your head by yourself coming See, up. But to, oh, no, so that, I guess that's the distinction I make is to me, that's not a brainstorming as much as that is going through the analysis process. I'm seeing that A, B, C, D, therefore E makes sense. I'm not going A, B, C, D, okay, E, F, G, H, I, let's see which one of these works. It's usually more so you see the, the natural fit of what's actually going in there. And that's why I think it's an important step to problem solving is because you see the thing that actually fits more. And usually when you do the brainstorming stuff, sometimes you come into a few, but in my experience, a lot of it is very much, there's only, I mean, there's multiple solutions to things, but you're going to see all the different problems and that kind of stuff as you're going through the process. There's usually so that I, I one actually fitting and it's that natural solution. You're getting wrapped around the axle on the brain academic brainstorming, because really what you're doing in your mind is you're, you're creating and analyzing possible courses of action in your mind. And then you're saying, okay, well, what if we did this? Uh, no, no. Okay. Yeah. If I did this and I did that. Okay. Yeah. 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 And then you're, Oh, so this is it. This sounds like the best solution. And then you start to move forward with that. That's your brainstorming. You're not doing a, a formal academic, like I said, you know, sitting around the table sort of thing. You're still in your mind, creating solutions and analyzing them in your mind. You're doing the, you're doing the, the uh, truncated, rapid decision-making process of finding a solution. Mm -hmm. You're creating various solution sets, courses of action in your mind, analyzing them yourself in your mind, and then saying, okay, this one I believe is the best one, as opposed to the big formal process. And I would say, I would say a difference on that though, is that when you're going through uh, in the meditation sense of that, is that you're not, and I guess this is where I'm drawing the distinction, I would say from brainstorming, from brainstorming solutions versus going through the process of analyzing, coming up with a solution. Uh, because to me, the brainstorming, what that usually is, and especially if you're thinking in the academic sense, like you were saying, but generally that's volume and then effectiveness. I think that's the big difference there. Whereas when you're going through the meditation process of trying to analyze a problem, it's, it's much more of a linear process that these things are all happening. These are the problems. These are the factors. Here's a solution. Okay. How can that affect this? What's wrong with that solution? What would we need to tweak? And then you go from there rather than doing the, okay, you know, here's as many solutions as I could think of. Here's possible outcomes. And then you're, and then you're analyzing it. You know, it's like when you do uh, we've talked about before pre-mortems. When we do a pre-mortem, you're coming up with as many problems as you can, and then you're solving the solutions afterwards. And I think, that, I think that's an important distinction because it goes back to the framing side of things of looking at the entire picture and seeing how things fit together versus trying to fall, solve solutions to that specific problem and kind of pinpointing it a little bit more. You're doing the same thing. You're just labeling it differently. Seriously, you, you know. <laughs> From a formal, you know, a, a full on formal planning process where you do brainstorming and then you, then you, then you weed through the brainstorm ideas and you grab pieces and parts and, and you create a, a handful of possible solutions and you analyze those solutions, you dive into those and you do your wargaming on those, you do your analysis on those, you create decision criteria and you define your decision criteria on each one of those in order to make sure that you, know, you can evaluate them. You evaluate each one of those courses of action on the decision criteria you create. Then you analyze those a bit more and then you compare, you may eliminate a couple and then you compare a handful of them did it down to three or four and you can compare them to each other using your decision criteria. And then that's going to be your solution. You're just doing it all in your head. You know, what I was going to say for that, and we'll leave this as the last question as we're going for a while here already, but does it matter? 
<laughs> like we were talking about critical constraints and all that kind of stuff. Doesn't matter if you think of it one way versus the other. Not really, because you're still going through the same process, like you're saying. That's, and that's, that's, that's where you're getting, you're getting tied up on, you know, like, just like you were saying with assumptions, uh, assumptions versus implied tasks. Mm -hmm. There's no need to get tied up on this because at the end of the day, if I go meditate and come to you with a solution and you go brainstorm and you come to me with a solution, that's all, all we're doing is trying to find the solutions. You're, you you got to focus on the desired outcome there, not on the label and getting into the uh, arbitrary side of things of what kind of language you're using about stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it, it is. It's, you know, don't get wrapped around the actual, it, it's understand the process and that's what's important. If you're doing it all in your head, because that's how you operate, or if you're in a room with your whole team and you're going through it with your whole team and a much more formal because you have time, then hey, it's it's all it's all about process and understanding the process. So what'd you learn? Uh, so that was going to be mine. It's just that really when you get down into it, that it's not worth. You know, we can do this on the show every now and then, but it's not worth the time to get into the labels of things. It's important to focus on the outcomes, focus on the mechanisms of what's actually happening, understand why you're doing it, what you're actually doing, because you can sit here all day and talk about the exact same thing and be pissed off at each other that you have a different label for it. You know, you could apply that. I'm thinking of all these different rugby coaching stuff now where I could sit there and go, Ooh, well, I think we should do this. Eh, well, this works out better strategically. We're saying the same damn thing. I just like to call it a different thing because I was I learned rugby in Colorado and you learned it in Arizona. And so we have different language around the way we do things. Doesn't mean that the outcomes are different. Doesn't mean our mechanisms are any different. We're just getting hung up on the labels. Yeah. yeah. Well, what'd you learn today? Uh, why is this happening? It's always a great thing to continually ask yourself and, and understand having a full understanding of the problem. When you dive in and do that problem analysis to create that, restated problem it is why is this happening what is what what else is there behind there so that when i create a solution then it's truly a solution as opposed to a partial solution or or maybe i don't quite achieve the outcome i'm looking to create but the more i understand the why behind it and the hows and all those things behind it as i'm doing the analysis better off, the more likely I am to create a solution that's going to give me the outcome we have. Mm -hmm. So, and, I, and I'd say the, the why also eliminates any issue as far as the imagined malice. Yeah. Because you're, once, you, once you really start looking at why, it's hard to think that your neighbor's pissed off and he drove a, drove a bolt into your truck tire. It's really mm -hmm. hard to, make, to square those ideas when you get into the analysis side of things. Yeah, yeah. Great. Well, a lot of fun. Episode number 50. We'll put this one in the books and uh, run us out, Camden. I was going to say number 50, and you forgot to mention over 2,000 downloads now also. So we hit oh, that yeah. 2,000 mark before a year, which I'm deciding is a great metric for success, obviously. Right? <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, thank you all again for listening to today's show. And thank you. Uh, special thank you to our guests. Or, ooh, see... This is the problem when you start reading things. <laughs> I messed myself up on that, started trying to go off the hip. It was not happening today. That's all yeah. right. We keep going forward. Special thank you to our sponsors. There we go. That's the word I was looking for. MASH, Military and Athletic Strength Hemp Oil, and Verbi Virtual Fundraising. You can check out recent episodes of the Cam and Otis Show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And this, uh, you can check out a full archive of the Cam and Otis Show at the Cam and Otis Show .com. Cam and Otis Show is on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Thanks again, y'all. We'll see you next week.